worship for Sunday, March the 14th, 2021, the fourth Sunday in Lent, Year B. The fourth of the promises providing a baptismal lens this Lent is the promise that God makes to Moses, those who look on the bronze serpent will live. In today's gospel, Jesus says he will be lifted up on the cross like the serpent, so that those who look to him in faith will live. When we receive the sign of the cross in baptism, that cross becomes the sign we can look to in faith for healing, for restored relationships to God, and for hope when we are dying. The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weber from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us for worship today. In this season of Lent, we focus on spiritual disciplines, those things that nurture our faith relationship with God, such as pausing midweek for continuing education and reflection. This year, our Eastern Synod has arranged a series called You're Not Who You Think You Are, Lent and the New You. Each Wednesday in Lent, Pastor David McGinley will help us to explore this great surprise and ways that we can integrate this truth into our lives. These Wednesday gatherings will be held by Zoom. Even if you don't use a computer, you can still hear his presentations by telephone. Details are in the bulletin. Thank you to our Minister of Music, Katrina Lowe, for playing a prelude and postlude for us today. And thank you to her mother, Karen Peters, for recording Katrina's music. Thank you also to our reader for today, Josh Hyde. As we prepare to eventually move back to in-person worship, Sue Brethauer has donated two video cameras and Tim Weber is donating the interface and computer that will allow us to stream live to YouTube. We thank them for their very generous gifts. We need a set of headphones with the common 1 8 inch plug. They have to be over the ear or on the ear type, not earbuds. And we need a monitor 19 inches or larger with an HDMI and or VGA port displaying 1080p. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. Most monitors would be acceptable. So if you have a set of headphones or a monitor you could donate, please let me know. In these challenging and unforeseeable times, if you find that you need someone to talk to, or if you need any assistance, please email me at the church office or phone me and I will help you. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to be together in whatever way possible in this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, ever creating, ever transforming, ever enlivening, source of love and liberation, our heart and our home. Amen. In Jesus, we have met the one who, with his very life, showed us the power of love to transform the lives of all who are vulnerable. We confess the ways in which we steadfastly cling to our rights and entitlements, refusing to be changed or even touched by the world's pain. Transforming Christ. Move us from comfort to courage, from empathy to engagement, from prayer to policy change. Enlivening Spirit, Breathe into us the breath of your grace, that we may release our hold on the fear and arrogance that keep us from knowing wholeness. Because we have met Jesus, we are ever being transformed. We are ever being enlivened with the Spirit's power, the grace of God, in whom we live and move and have our being. Forgiveness, grace, and love are yours to have and yours to share now and always. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, when your people, the Israelites, were in the wilderness, you delivered them from their distress by healing them 
And when we were dead in our relationship with you, you acted through your grace to make us alive again in Christ. Living then as new creations in him and with him, may we reflect your grace at work in our lives, confident and trusting in your love for us and for all that you have made through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Children's time. How big is God's love? I'm so very glad that you're here today, and I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. When you were little, or maybe when your brother or sister or cousin was little, did you ever play that game, How Big? In that game, someone will ask a little child, How big? How big? And the little child will respond, So big! as she spreads her, spreads her arms wide. Little children love that game and will play it over and over again. Today's Bible story about Jesus is really asking the question of God's love for us. How big? And the answer is so big. The way Jesus answered the question about how big God's love is was by saying the best known Bible verse. It's from John chapter 3 verse 16 and it's this. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his only son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God's love for us is so big that we can't measure it. We can't measure God's love with this giant cup measure. We can't measure God's love with this really big tape measure. And we can't measure God's love with this really big clock because God's love lasts forever. How big is God's love? It's so big that we can't even measure it. Now I invite you to move into your favorite prayer posture. It may be hands open facing up to receive the gift of God's presence in prayer. It may be hands folded and eyes closed to help you concentrate. Or it may be crossing your arms across your chest to form an X, the first letter of Christ in Greek, and it feels like a hug from God. Now let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us so much. Help us to pass on that love to all those around us so that we share eternal life, the kind of life that you want us to live here and now. Amen. Your parents have children's bulletins for you that you're welcome to work on at any time, even while you're listening to the sermon. The Lifting Up of the Serpent Though God provides food and water for the Israelites in the wilderness, they whine and grumble. They forget about the salvation they experienced in the Exodus. God punishes them for their sin, but God also provides a means of healing, a bronze serpent lifted up on a pole. A reading from Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God, against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? where there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Comments on the first reading. Look at the serpent and live. 
Look at the snake that bit you and you'll be healed. God has freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. When they had faced almost certain annihilation at the Sea of Reeds, God provided them with a way through. When they were thirsty, God provided them with water. And when they complained that the water was bitter, God sweetened it. When they were hungry, God gave them manna to eat. And when they complained about the one item menu, God sent quail in addition to the manna. Then in today's first reading, God's people disrespect their provider God even further by saying there is no food and no water and we detest this miserable food the very food that God had provided them. This time, God didn't seek to meet their complaints. This time, God did not respond by providing manna or water or quail. This time, God sent fiery poisonous serpents that bit the people so that many Israelites died. And then God provided the cure. Simply look at the serpent of bronze and live. You know, in order to be healed, we often need to look squarely at the thing that is causing us trouble. The first step in getting help is to recognize that we need help. Part of the training to become a pastor is to work for a summer as a chaplain in a hospital. When I was at Grand River Hospital learning to become a chaplain, the hugely respected Ken Beale was my supervisor. He explained to us young seminarians that the role of a counselor is not always to ease the client's pain to make them feel better. Sometimes the healing thing to do is to put the client's feet closer to the fire. That is to help the client feel more severely the pain of their current situation so that the pain will give them a reason to change, to seek healing. We're learning this as a society. We're beginning to look straight at what is wrong. I see this happening in the Me Too campaigns in which brave women are speaking the truth about being abused by men in power, most recently in the Canadian Armed Forces. Sometimes healing can only occur when we look straight at the problem. This also holds true for combating systemic racism. The first step is to recognize the white privilege that many of us hold and then see the ways in which the system is set up for the benefit of those with power so that they can keep their power. But it begins with looking unflinchingly at what is wrong. The church has been instrumental and at the forefront of helping us to address these social issues. Sometimes healing can only occur when we look straight at the problem. And God is helping us to look at the serpent of bronze, the problem at hand, and live. God is helping us to work through a solution. If you are struggling to recognize and work through a problem that you have, phone me at the church office or email me, and I'll be glad to help. Saved by grace, through faith, for good works. While we were dead in our relationship with God, God acted to make us spiritually alive as a gift of grace in Christ Jesus. We are saved not by what we do, but by grace through the gift of faith. Thus, our good works are really a reflection of God's grace at work in our lives. A reading from Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Comments on the second reading. How big is our part? In today's second reading, the author of Ephesians describes us as being dead in our trespasses. The usual picture that is imagined is God reaching down to us, but stopping just short of taking our hand. In this imagined scenario, we then must raise our hands slightly to grab hold of God. God does most of the work, and we have our little part too. But this is a terrible interpretation of this passage, because those who are dead, as the letter to the Ephesians says, simply cannot raise a hand and grab hold of God. In the scenario outlined by the author of the Ephesians, it has to be totally God's work. The terrible misunderstanding is repeated when picturing verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Here the picture is wrongly understood as God graciously offering salvation, and all we have to do is believe. Our part is to have faith. But these verses clearly state that faith and salvation are not our own doing. You have been saved through faith, we read, and this is not your own doing. Even the faith which receives God's salvation, even our faith, is a gift from God. In our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada devotional book, Eternity for Today, Pastor Nathan Fong told a story to illustrate this truth. He wrote, When I was in my early 20s, I almost drowned. I was swimming at a local lake with my brother and two buddies, and I realized I had no idea what I was doing. After all, I had failed swimming level maroon three times. I tried to swim to the middle of the lake, and suddenly my body couldn't move anymore. Water quickly filled my mouth as I helplessly bobbed up and down. Thankfully, I didn't drown. My excellent swimmer buddies got to my side within seconds to pull me to safety. Turns out my brother was as bad a swimmer as I was. But coincidentally enough, the British Columbia swim team was there, and their captain was able to get my brother in time. God works in mysterious and very nerve-wracking ways. My brother and I didn't ask to be rescued. We weren't asked for permission. We weren't sized up for our worthiness either. We were just saved. God saves us, continues Pastor Fong, from the consequences of sin and guilt, not because we are good enough or because we chose to be saved or because we did anything in any way. God saves us because we need saving and only God can save us. For by grace are we saved by faith, and this is not our own doing. Because my salvation is totally in God's hands, my salvation is secure. And that's very good news. The Lifting Up of the Son of Man To explain the salvation of God to the religious leader, Nicodemus, Jesus refers to the scripture passage quoted in today's first reading. Just as those who looked upon the bronze serpent were healed, so people will be saved when they behold Christ lifted up on the cross. The Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed but those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in god the gospel of the lord a beloved child of god for God so loved the world. That means that God loves you, that God loves me, and God loves the person next to you, whether that's someone on the couch beside you or in the home next to yours. God so loved the world. We are beloved children of God. In today's gospel reading, Jesus refers to the story we heard as our first reading, in which the people were directed to look up to the bronze snake on a pole to look up in order to be saved. And I think this is a great metaphor for a way to live our own lives. This Lenten season, Pastor David McGinley has been leading us through a Wednesday evening series on Zoom about what he learned from his near-death experience. Like many who have died, but who have then been resuscitated and brought back to life, Pastor David has experienced just how much God loves him a life-altering experience. And he's been sharing those insights with us Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. on Zoom. He summarizes what he's learned this way. The astonishing surprise, often not realized until the very end of life, is that you are more than you could imagine, for you emanate from and are sustained by God. Even more, that you and reality are so much more than you could comprehend. Look up to the bronze snake on a pole and be saved. I wonder how our lives might be different if we were to look up to God for our primary identity. You are more than a parent or child. You are more than the job you hold or the job you were laid off from. You are more than your specific skills and talents. You are more than the marks you receive at school or in your year-end review. Being loved exactly the way we are, having our identity formed by God's great love for us, rather than having our identity formed by our own merits, means that we no longer have to hide our imperfections and mistakes. Shame and even fear can take flight. Our scars and wounds no longer define us, and our desperate attempts to be loved are simply no longer needed. Joy might become our constant companion. How would your life be different, better, if you really clung to the reality that you are a beloved child of God, worth dying for? How does the recognition of that great truth help you right now in whatever situation you are facing. And what difference does it make to you that the creator God of the entire cosmos loves you? These questions are written in the box just below this video on YouTube. I hope you'll spend some time thinking about that later today and throughout the week. And then, Consider how you might be called to extend that love to everyone you encounter. For we are beloved children of God, sent to make a difference in the world God so dearly loves. Amen.
relying on the promises of God. We pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need, saying, Hear us, O God, and responding, Your love is great. You sent your Son that the world might be saved through him. Inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. Empower missionaries, ministries of service, and partnerships in ministry. Bless the Reverend Dr. Christine Lund in her new role as Principal Dean of Martin Luther University College, formerly Waterloo Lutheran Seminary. That God would bless her leadership in this school that is so central to our lives in the Eastern Synod. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. From east to west, your steadfast love is shown. Nourish seas and deserts, wilderness areas and cities. Give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures. Bless farmers as they prepare for the growing season. Help us to care for those hurt by global climate change. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. You sustained your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis. Prosper the work of those who aid victims of famine and drought. Bring peace in places where scarce resources cause violence. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. Your mercy endures forever. Deliver all who cry to you, especially those who are hungry or without homes. Give life in places where death seems triumphant. Give healing to those who are sick and comfort to those who mourn, including those whom we name before you. Hear us, O God, your love is great. By grace we have been saved. Fill this congregation to overflowing with that grace, that we show loving kindness and mercy to others. Give us patience and courage when the way seems long. Hear us, O God, your love is great. Your Son was lifted up to give eternal life. Bring us with all the saints into the fullness of your promises. Hear us, O God, your love is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace. receive the blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.